This is a tip bump joint. An inquiry found in Rotherham there were more than 1,400 victims, 1,400 victims of grooming and sexual exploitation between 97 and 2013. That's just in one town, but it gets worse. Then it happened in Rochdale. They found sentences were given up to 19 years because of crimes committed against girls between the age of 13 and 15 in and around Rochdale between 2008 and 2010. Then there was a case in Oxford in 2013 where five Muslim men were convicted and handed sentences at the Old Bailey uh, for uh, exploiting girls between 11 and 15. Uh, all of the men were of Pakistani origin uh, except for two who were North African, also Muslim. Then it was in Bristol where 13 Somali Muslim men were jailed for more than a total of 100 years after they were convicted in 2014 of running an inner city sex ring. Then in Aylesbury, six South Asian men were jailed in 2015 for grooming underage white girls between 2006 and 2012. Then in Peterborough, a total of 10 men were convicted of child sex crimes in the town. And the boss, uh, Mohammed Khobeib, who was originally from Pakistan, he was jailed for 13 years at the Old Bailey after he was found guilty of forcing a 14-year-old girl to perform a sex act on him. And then Newcastle and Daniel, you know what? It's not always a, a Muslim issue. Concentrating on one area of a community as abusers is not always helpful because other people might get ignored. Although the majority of child sex abusers are white, as there is a particular problem in some towns with Muslim gangs. The force insists that speaking to community leaders before making arrests isn't the same as being afraid to investigate. It was in 2010 that a social worker from the Children's Safeguarding Division walked into her manager's office and dropped a folder on her desk. Inside that folder was over 30 cases of young girls between 13 and 17 who were being sexually abused by Pakistani grooming gangs. But her manager's response wasn't what she'd expected because she angrily reprimanded her, saying she should never refer to Asians and child grooming in the same sentence. She was then taken off the case and told it wouldn't go any further and put on a week-long ethnicity and diversity sensitivity course. When she got back from the course, she found out her folders were missing and they'd been deleted off her hard drive. And for the next six months that she spent at the safeguarding agency, she was targeted and bullied by management until she was pushed out of a job. Welcome to the UK's Children's Safeguarding Agency. I was just going on a weekend with my friends and I started talking to some young boys and I built a friendship with them. And then as time went on, they started to introduce older people. Saying that I didn't want to do it and stuff and he said, of course you want to do it and that. He don't like girls saying that. No, to him, and he doesn't accept it. was a barrier to investigating, that it was seen to be too... He said that I was a white bitch and he had enough of me and he punched me in the mouth. And then he said if I... Broke down the just kept saying they're raping me, they're raping she me. She describes being abused by one man with his friends watching, egging him on. With them, and I'd think, why is my boyfriend asking me to have sex with someone else? A dark cloud hung over this town. A reign of abuse will... that will cast shadows on young lives for lifetimes to come. England has always been about the rich and the poor. The haves, the have-nots, us and them. And there's no in-between. And not surprisingly, it disproportionately favors the rich. A class system where all you gotta do is open your mouth and they know whether you swallow or not. With many in the south, meaning London, considering the northeast the ass crack of England, where the beer tastes like piss and the women spread their syphilis. It's no surprise that the beloved Cumberbatches, the Redmonds, the Hinterwurst, the Winslets, aren't the salt of the earth that they make themselves out to be. And my guess is when they're in town, they're not popping into the local kebab shop. And when they walk down that red carpet, there's as much working class grit on their heels 
as there is scuff marks on a cripple's boot, with the Northeast being where the majority of Pakistani immigrants settled when they came to England in the 50s and the 60s to work in the booming textiles industry. A generally hard-working people, and despite the eventual decline of the textiles in the 70s, they kept coming and coming. I guess they liked the weather. And when the bottom of the textiles industry fell out, they started opening chippies and kebab shops and driving mini cabs. It's worth noting that 90% of Pakistanis are of the Muslim faith. And with the shift towards areas of industry, their critics complained that they didn't integrate, forming their own ghettos. And when the country changed with the times, well, they didn't so much especially their views towards the fairer sex, with many believing that that is the epicenter of the Pakistani child grooming gangs. After all, it is the godless white woman putting herself out there, bearing her fruits for any man to enjoy. Well, unless he's a homo. I'm guessing this joker isn't interested. Oh well, more for me. But let's not get fooled into thinking that in the 70s and the 80s, these attitudes were purely Pakistani. Because this is the Northeast after all, where women were still ruled by a strong hand. And let's not forget the birthplace of prolific pedo Jimmy Savile, who is currently holding sway over Great Britain's youth. But the country's attitudes towards women was about to change. But not by everybody. It was around 2001 that a filthy secret could no longer be contained and began to seep out of its scab like pus from a sepsis wound. And that scab had been social services and police. Report after report. Whistleblowers, the victims, the victims' families. It seemed that it was becoming too hard to ignore and it was the worst kept secret in England. With their stories never deviating, the girls, poor white trash with little to no education, with the parents being no different. Drugs, alcoholism, hell, sometimes a dad got in there first and the kid's only escape is the street. Then Mr. Pakistani comes along in a flashy car, gives a girl a little attention, gives her some alcohol, splashes some cologne on his balls. And if the parents even bother to complain, the cops tell them it's a lifestyle choice and it's your job as the parent to change that choice. She's prostituting herself and likes the taste of curry on her cock. And even when these respected businessmen, pillars of the community, were beating the girls and passing them around like one of those diarrhea-inducing snacks they eat, the victims believed that they owed these men something, that they were their boyfriends. But if they refused their wishes, they were beaten, thrown naked into a trunk, driven into the middle of nowhere, then thrown into a vacant lot like garbage. And when the fish and chip eating cops found them, they were usually put into care. And even if the parents were bothered enough to raise a stink, their background meant that no one was gonna listen to them, much less the police. Because they were just cannon fodder, and they knew it. Because let's not forget that England's all about the class system. Rich and poor, us and them. And then they were pushing me head on the floor and that and grabbing my neck and stuff and pulling me by my hair. I was saying that I didn't want to do it and stuff and he said, of course you want to do it and that. He don't like girls saying that no to him and he don't accept it when they say no. And even with the facts right in their face, cops, social services, media, they all said it wasn't race related. He said that I was a white bitch and he'd had enough of me and he punched me in the mouth and then he said if I ate up in my mouth again, he'd do it harder. And although the media and police tried to crush any voices of dissension by using headlines like racism and extreme right wing, the more the stories came out, the angrier people got. It is a Muslim issue because it's religiously justified as long as it's other people's children and not their own. And I guess just like the English have their class system of us and them, the Pakistanis got theirs, us. And them, with a lot of people saying it was the parents' fault for being so lax. And although the courts tried to keep their name and race a secret, throwing you in with the extreme right wing with jail, if you even mentioned it, it was impossible to ignore the fact that all the victims were underprivileged, underage white girls being groomed by older Pakistani men of the Muslim faith 
the UK authorities were gaslighting a whole nation. And there are those commentators who have said that before we had a pandemic, we had a pachydemic. The girl who had first met her boyfriend, as she called him, who was a married man in his 40s when she was 12. She'd got pregnant, she'd had an abortion at 13. You'd meet one, she used the adjective packy to describe the man. Meet one packy, within 10 days, you got 10 packies in your phone book. Within a few weeks, you've got a whole phone book full of packies. And she would be rung up by randomers, men she didn't know at all. She would go and stand in a car park in the middle of Hayward and wait to be collected, taken to an address she didn't know, plied with alcohol, and then passed around for sex. And she thought these guys were kind, because they took an interest in her. There were many commentators who believed that the government and police's silence and feigned ignorance was because they didn't want to replicate the race riots of 35 years earlier. But that didn't help the young girls in the present. And it didn't help 13-year-old Sammy Woodhouse either. The Darrow 18 was no different from any other girl finding her way in this world. But she would become an unlikely hero. Coming from a broken home, not getting enough love, she took to the streets to find it. But the streets of Rochdale at night are no place for a child. And if your door is open for trouble, it'll walk right in, or in this case, roll. Such is the case of one Ashid Hussein, also known as Mad Ash. And although a leg mental, it seems he had no problems getting a leg over, because the married man with two kids was already grooming and having sex with seven underage girls when he met and started seeing the 14-year-old, beating her every day passing her around to his body loving buddies. And when he wasn't grooming young girls, he supplemented his income by driving around town in his cripple mobile, dealing drugs to children. And he, along with his two brothers, terrorized the neighborhood. Although I'm guessing it was more the two brothers than Lightning McQueen here. Sammy was abused over a four year period and ended up having two kids with her abuser. And he even got her to help him deal drugs. Well known to the authorities, the police busted into his house several times, even once when he was balls deep in the child, and they did nothing. But after she became legal, and he wasn't interested anymore, and he'd stopped calling, when the cops wouldn't listen, she called the papers. And the bug-eyed, packy, paraplegic pedophile was the first domino to fall, and the country couldn't ignore it anymore. Maggie's the only person here today who's used the word cover-up. Do any of the rest of you think this is a cover-up? When I heard Maggie say that this had been abruptly closed, I wanted to know the reason why. And as the authorities made excuses, like a kid getting caught jerking off by his mother, you couldn't help but laugh. So, um, uh, abruptly. Um, and the records say it was a question of resources. And once the Times broke the story, that had been in plain view to the town residents and police for years, the rest of the media followed. A feeding frenzy, like a hemophiliac thrown into a shark tank. With over 1,400 girls in Rothram alone, and from coast to coast, everybody had a story, and the authorities started doing some damage control. This has been a fantastic result for British justice. These victims have been through the most horrendous of crimes, and I just want to commend their bravery in relation to the ordeal they've had to go through. These are the most vulnerable in our society. I want to apologise to all of those vulnerable children who were let down in 2004 when Greater Manchester Police did not thoroughly investigate the abhorrent offences that had been committed against them. I want to say that I'm personally disgusted that these children were not cared for and the awful abuse they suffered. I'm committed to doing all that we can to ensure that they receive the justice today that they were denied 15 years ago. But now the floodgates were open and victim after victim were coming forward. From shore to shore, abuse dating back to the 80s. And they all told the same story about how they told the cops and the child protection agencies. And they did nothing because the long and the short of it. And everybody knew these girls were cannon fodder, and no one wanted to seem racist. I mean, how bad would that look on the cops? Especially with a general election looming, and with immigration and asylum seekers 
being the number one source of contention. Well, let's face it, these girls were gonna probably end up with a half cast kid anyways, and they were already going nowhere fast. It was just collateral damage. And remember, it's about us and them, the rich and the poor. Heard many of these girls allow these men to go on abusing them because they believe mistakenly that they're in love with them, that the men are their boyfriends. And grooming creates a sort of perverse story around what's happening, that the girls are giving sex in exchange for something else, as if they're somehow complicit in what's going Five on. Five of them, the youngest was aged just 13, and she in fact became pregnant. These are girls from troubled backgrounds. And they were initially flattered by the compliments of these men. Then she became scared, and then in her words, after that, it just didn't bother. As far as I'm concerned, I told everybody that these children were being abused. Let it be blunt. Do you think the failure in Rochdale was due to incompetence or indifference? It was attitudes towards teenagers. It was absolute disrespect that vulnerable young people did not have a voice. They were, they were overlooked. They were discriminated against. They were, um, they were treated appallingly by, by protective services. Dealing with vulnerable victims, we've long had operations against things like child prostitution, operation messenger. It's not fair to say we did nothing. We did do something. We perhaps didn't do as, as effectively as we would have liked to, and that's... It's the lack of sharing of data across services. And I guess it now seems ironic that the cops and the social services, in their quest to adhere to a left-wing agenda and protect the scumbag pedophiles because they were Pakistanis, well, they ended up being racist anyways racist against their own children, leading them like lambs to the slaughter. And with every chance they had, telling us that it wasn't about race. But when they arrested the minicab drivers, the kebab shop owners, the ones who owned the news agents, well, they said the exact opposite to the cops. And they stood up in court in front of all who were watching and they said that the white girls were dirty sluts. At Big Mouths, they were rude. They drank alcohol. They were godless. And if the white man had taken care of them, they wouldn't have done what they did. And they should be thanking them. And they were shocked and indignant, feeling that they hadn't done anything wrong. But I guess the judge, now, well, he disagreed.